Welcome back, everybody. This is part two of six of the series Healthcare Kata. This is Michael Lombard again. I'm the Corporate Director of Operational Excellence for Cornerstone Healthcare Group. And today, we're going to continue our discussion of kind of my learnings and my trials and errors and the good and the bad and the ugly of me applying the Toyota Kata approach in healthcare for the past couple of years. In today's video, we're going to dive a little deeper into uh, the Toyota Kata approach. And um, if you've read the book by Mike Rother, which is excellent, um, you probably have a much deeper understanding of some of these concepts. I'm just going to provide a, a quick overview, hopefully in seven slides or less. This is kind of an experiment for me. But I'm going to just kind of briefly touch upon some of the key concepts. But I highly encourage you to either read the book or Google Toyota Kata Mike Rother and go to his website um, through the University of Michigan. There's just a tremendous amount of of slide shares and videos and downloadables that will definitely add to what I'm going to present here today. You can also go to lean.org slash kata and also find information there. So here goes. One of the major elements of the Toyota Kata approach is what we call the improvement kata. And you can think of the word kata as just meaning a set of routines or behaviors or habits. And the improvement kata is the set of habits and routines that we want to see displayed when we're approaching process improvement. And they're shown here kind of in a left to right fashion, but I want to caution that these four routines are not exactly always sequential from left to right. Uh, there, it's not an algorithm or a straightforward protocol. It's uh, more of a loosely related set of routines that we kind of perform left to right, but they're very recursive meaning that we kind of go back and update our understanding of things as we go as we go into the kata. So um, with that in mind, I will point your attention to the bottom of the slide where it shows planning and executing. Um, the first three routines kind of loosely make up the, the planning phase of an improvement effort. And then the fourth routine kind of makes up the executing phase of an improvement routine. But all four routines kind of have a, a common glue that ties them together, and that is the purpose of all of them is to help us learn and to strengthen our, our understanding of how to do process improvement work. Starting on the left with the first routine, understanding the direction or challenge. You see we've shown a compass there uh, that shows true north and this kind of image is used to kind of help explain that we want the person pursuing the improvement effort, the problem solver, before they jump in and start firefighting and playing whack-a-mole, we want them to step back out of their situation for a second and look out and see the big picture and see the direction in which uh, we're headed and the ideal vision of where we want to go with this process or with our department or with the organization as a whole. And we want them to identify what is the kind of big challenge that needs to be addressed. You know, is there a big key performance indicator goal that we are trying to achieve to grow the business or is there a new strategy that we need to deploy or is there a, a new technological system that we're trying to adopt? Those are big challenges. And by first stepping back out of the out of the immediate situation and and seeing the big picture, um, the problem solver or what we call the learner is able to to align their efforts with the direction of the organization. They're able to plug and play with bigger and strategic improvement efforts. And that makes their work much more meaningful and it prevents us from going off on unrelated tangents. And then that propels us into the second routine, which is to grasp the current condition. And we've shown some um, eyeglasses here. And the idea there is that you should go and see, you should go and understand the facts of the current condition. How is the process currently performed? How well is that process performing? What are the key opportunities for improvement? What are some of the root causes of those opportunities? Or more specifically, what do we think are the root causes of those opportunities? We don't necessarily know, but we have a hypothesis at this point. And then we move into the third routine, which is to establish the next target condition. So if the overall direction is defined by some big challenge that's going to take us a year or two to achieve, that's too far off in the distance for us to be working on it right now. We need to not try to eat the whole apple in one bite, but to take one bite of the apple at a time. And that bite is a target condition. And so we want to look over the course of the next couple of weeks to the next couple of months. What is something that we can achieve, a change in the process, 
that will gain us some improved results and that we can learn from. And once we achieve that target condition, then we establish the next one and so on and so forth until we achieve our challenges. And once you start to think in terms of target conditions, you start to kind of develop this iterative mindset. And that really is what the fourth routine is all about, is iterating toward the target condition. It's kind of like you're on a staircase. You're at the bottom, which is your current condition, and you can see the top of the staircase, but you're not looking at the very top all the time. You're looking down at the next step to make sure that you don't trip over some obstacle that's in your way, some barrier. And those obstacles give us opportunities to kind of iterate and try new things and experiment and do cycles of PDCA or plan, do, check, act. And look at it. Is that we're trying to navigate our way through a gray zone. We're in the current, we're trying to get to the target, but we don't know exactly the path that's gonna get there. So we kind of accept that and we say, we know the path is gonna be meandering a little bit, but when we meander or when we take a step backwards, that's not a failure. That's just an experiment that we've learned from. We've clarified that, oops, that's not the direction to go. It's this other direction. And only through trial and error, through experimentation, do we navigate our way through the gray zone. I think that's much better than trying to pretend like we have all the answers, like we know all the obstacles and we know exactly how to get from point A to point B, which sends the message that it's not really okay to experiment and have trial and error and learn. That's the wrong message. We want to send the message, yes, we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. Yes, it is okay to experiment and meander a little bit as long as we're learning every step of the way. That builds the right habits. Another way to think about it is that at some point in our journey from current to target, we're going to hit our knowledge threshold. And if we're doing in a, a workshop in a boardroom where we're using sticky notes to map out a process and do a root cause analysis, at some point, we, we're going to hit our knowledge threshold. And it's a really good behavior when you see an organization stop at that point and say, let's not try to analyze this any further. Let's go and see for, with our own eyes what the real deal is. Let's expand our knowledge threshold. Let's start to test and experiment and meander a little bit so that we can kind of extend our knowledge threshold towards the target condition, as opposed to a more dysfunctional behavior, which would be to let's kind of continue to try to deep dive and make a lot of assumptions about what the root cause is and that so on and so forth. That does not promote a very scientific mindset. It does not promote a culture of experimentation, trial and error, and it doesn't really help us build any habits as it relates to you know, plan, do, check, act, and, and, and kind of thinking uh, in terms of every step as an experiment. When you start to think that way though, uh, when you start to practice the improvement kata, a systematic scientific pattern of working on improvement starts to emerge and it can kind of be viewed like this. Instead of a, a we have a pain and we wanna make the pain go away or we have a fire and we wanna put the fire out, we start looking at improvement work as an evolution from current to the next target by removing obstacles and then the next target after that, and then the next target after that, and eventually we start achieving challenges. And then the more challenges that we start achieving, the closer we start moving towards our vision of what ideal looks like or the overall direction that we wanna head with our organization. This type of mindset can be developed as you practice the improvement kata. However, it takes a while. And if you are doing improvement work on your own in isolation, you can kind of give up before you ever develop this mindset. For that reason, it behooves us to have coaching. But of course, coaching itself doesn't become a skill that emerges on its own. We have to actually work at it. That's what the coaching kata is all about. And that's the other major element of the Toyota kata approach. And it's these two routines that you can see in red. The first one is planning coaching cycles. And the second one is executing coaching cycles. And the idea here is that during the planning phases, when the learner is trying to just figure out, you know, where they're headed, um, it can be very uh, troublesome. It can be very frustrating. We don't know exactly what the right direction is. And the coach's job there is to keep the learner treating every step as an experiment and uh, trying to go understand the current condition. And if we don't nail it the first time, we don't truly understand it the first time, we go back and do it the second time. And the coach is helping the learner not be discouraged and just kind of keep taking steps forward. 
when you get into the executing coaching cycles, I personally think it's a little bit easier to be the coach because the learner now has the target condition in their sights and the coach's job is just to make sure that they are identifying obstacles quickly and doing rapid cycles of plan, do, check, act. And we're not talking 30, 60, 90 day cycles. We're talking about 30, 60, 90 minute cycles, rapid cycles of testing. And the coach's job is to keep them focused on what's the very next obstacle that needs to be tackled, turning that PDCA wheel quickly. And it took me hundreds of coaching cycles before I started to understand how to be a halfway effective coach. And I think the insight that really turned the tide for me as a coach was that when I started realizing that it's not only the learner that's doing cycles of experimentation, it's also the coach. Every coaching cycle is, in fact, a little experiment related to your coaching technique. And so again, I'll turn your attention, like I did in the first video, to this image. And we'll keep coming back to this image during every video. But it's that the Toyota Kata is all about developing your brain, developing your mindset, developing your mental muscle memory. And that doesn't happen on its own. It happens through a mechanism, and I believe that to be the viewpoint that every step is an experiment. When you start talking like that, and you start acting like that, all of a sudden you start thinking like that, and you start viewing improvement on, on, as an ongoing thing uh, that occurs through a series of, of trial and error. And uh, I think that's very powerful. And in the next video, we're going to touch upon uh, how that has benefited me as I've started to try to facilitate improvement work and develop people in hospitals over the past couple of years. So stay tuned for video three in this six-part series.